this room for the day is Sumana. Sumana has helped or even initiated the rescue, restart or various open source projects. She's gained a great deal of wisdom on what it takes to coordinate, lead and even be a catalyst for teams of people in the open source communities. We are very fortunate to have her here today so we can benefit from that wisdom. Now, Sumana probably won't have times for talks for questions on the stream, but we'll be in the chat after the talk. So put your questions into the new questions tab. And if we have time, we'll go through one. Otherwise, uh, we'll talk about that in the chat. Sumana, take it away. Hi, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, linux.conf.au. There are no slides for today's presentation, but you should have a link in case you would like to take a look at the outline or have something to look at that's also got the relevant links from this presentation. Please feel free to wander away, do some stretching, doodling, what have you. I think that perhaps some of you have read or heard of or watched uh, Lord of the Rings. Don't worry, this is not going to be the kind of presentation where you need to have read or watched Lord of the Rings. There's this guy Frodo. And he says at one point when a bunch of other people are kind of squabbling, I will take the ring, though I do not know the way. I think maybe some of you feel like that, and that's why you're at this talk. Because there is some open source project that you care about that is stuck in some way, and you'd like to help get it unstuck. Maybe there is code in Git master that hasn't been released for years. You want to expedite that release. Maybe there's some kind of social issue that needs untangling or a workflow issue in order to help that project level up. Maybe there's just something you noticed and you were like, damn it, why doesn't someone do something about this? And that's when you realize that someone is you, uh, which is what I call damn it driven leadership. Uh, I have not trademarked this in, in any jurisdiction. So today I want to talk about things that I've learned about that moment where I or someone says, ah, like we could do something about this and then does it. So first I will share some stories with you of times when I've been able to do this, some as a volunteer and some in my consultancy because I have a consulting practice, Change Set Consulting, where I focus on this. And then I'll talk about the general sequence that I think generally you have to follow when you're doing something like this to gain credibility so that you can take charge and make change. And I want to talk a moment about why do projects get stuck in the first place? What can we do to help teach ourselves and each other the skills to get and stay unstuck? So I hope that you'll come away from this talk with steps that you can take in the short term and in the long term to address this for projects that you care about. So first, I will share with you a story or two about times when the help that a project needed and that I was able to provide had to do with gathering information and helping people make decisions. First, when it comes to just unifying the to-do list, sometimes that is the blocker that a project needs help with. In 2011, I helped out with the software behind a conference that I care a lot about called WISCON. WISCON takes place in Wisconsin in the United States, that's why it's called that, and it is a feminist sci-fi fantasy convention. I started attending in 2009 and I just loved being around people who shared my values, who wanted to talk about speculative fiction from an intersectionally feminist framework. And by the time in 2011 that I started helping out a little bit with the software behind it, I'd already been a project manager in proprietary and open source software for a few years. In 2011, I attended a session where the volunteers behind the software asked for some help. And I said, okay, sure, I'll, I'll time box it and I will help you for a few months. So over the course of three to four months in 2011, I took a look and I helped out because the volunteers who developed the software that was used for registration, for people suggesting program ideas and assigning who was gonna be on what panel, those volunteers had just a jumble of bug reports and feature requests and documentation in old emails and text notes and text files on people's computers and split up among Basecamp and a forge called Google Code. So over the course of those months, as a part-time volunteer, I consolidated and organized those to-dos, which meant reaching out to individual developers and saying, hey, do you got anything on your computer? like?" 
maybe a cheat sheet on how to set up the development environment and stuff like that. And I got those into a few places, a prioritized queue. And in particular, I put all of the code related issues into Google Code, uh, consolidated the documentation, and I kept the team all on the same page using Basecamp updates and also a weekly conference call. There was already a conference call happening every week, but it was more just a check-in instead of using that information to say, all right, therefore, what needs to happen next, who needs help, and, and so on. So some lessons from this. One is try to open all the drawers and look under the couch, is, is how I might put it. Look for where people are stashing notes and to-dos and other information when you start getting involved in a project or you want to help make change. Because you might get distracted by the should of, oh, well, everybody should be putting all of their code into this repository, branches in this repo. People should be posting to the public mailing list. But people in actual real life end up squirreling away information sometimes into uh, text files on their computers, emails, private chats with each other, and so on. So if you can do what I call opening all the drawers and looking under the couch so that you can then eventually unify and consolidate that information. Another thing is that when people are talking on a few different platforms, then it can be really helpful to not get too ideological and opinionated about what is the best place, right? What is the best platform for people to be using? Instead, look at what the people who are genuinely doing work right now are using and see if you can pick something that the most of them like and try and consolidate it so that most people, for the, most of the functions that they need in order to collaborate with each other, have to pay attention to as few different notifications as possible. Next, I'll talk about a time when the thing that I did was really to help filter and cohere the priority list. So this was when I did some work as a volunteer with GNU Mailman. Mailman is a mailing list manager. Or you may use it yourself, either as a systems administrator or as someone who subscribes to email that's hosted on a Mailman mailing list. They put out a number of releases in the 90s and the 2000s. Um, 2000, they had their 2.0 release. Their 2.1 release was in 2002. And then they had their first alpha of their 3.x branch in 2008. And this was a big major rewrite getting away from the monolith and so on. And as of 2015, they had been trying to get 3.0 out the door for about seven years. I came in as a volunteer, as someone who was pretty interested in being a Python code contributor. I wanted to improve my Python skills, and I thought, well, I'll contribute to this project that I use all the time. And my experience you know, I, I had some, and I had some experience as an open source software contributor and as an open source software leader as, as well. And I talked to my friend Terry, who was one of the maintainers of Mailman, uh, and she said, well, you know, what we really need is a release manager. And I thought, well, I'd rather participate as a, as a programmer if I can. But as I participated and tried to find things to work on as an independent code contributor, I kept finding that there were things that needed doing uh, in order for me to make that progress. And so I would do a little bit of cleanup over here and a little bit of cleanup over there. What bugs need fixing? Well, in order to do that, I guess I need to triage the bugs in this review queue and, and see what's not reproducible anymore. Well, what's the documentation for the developer setup? Well, I guess there's some inaccurate or obsolete information over here. I found out the correct information, so I'll update and deduplicate things and clean up the wiki while I'm at it. So I ended up getting a project management overview of the project in the course of trying to be a fairly minor code contributor. We got together at a sprint, uh, a work week in April 2015 at PyCon North America. And I had asked ahead of time, what, what are we aiming to do at this event? And the answer was, well, we're trying to get 3.0 out the door. But as we got there to this uh, four day work week, I saw that although everyone there wanted to help make progress and had some things they were working on, there was no one person who was really looking at the big picture of how do we make sure that each of us stays focused on the bit of this work that needs to happen so that we can get 3.0 released. 
I realized that uh, the first morning, and so I went over to the front desk of the sprint coordinators, grabbed a big post-it note that sticks on the wall and a, and a marker. I came back and I wrote on that butcher paper the 10 items that, according to our bug tracker, were blocking our release of 3.0. And even as I did that, and as we were talking just at the beginning of that first morning, people started saying, oh, wait, hold on, that's not really a blocker. Uh, that's already been fixed, or that's got obviated, or, well, if we solve this, it'll also solve that. We'd be able to cut that list in half through a little bit of communication. And then there were, you know, a few people around the table and me, and so people chose what they were going to work on and started going at it. And I floated around and basically helped people stay unblocked for the rest of those four days. I wrote draft release notes. I did some testing, dragged people over from other tables to do some testing as well. And I was able to help people by providing a first suggestion for how we might solve user experience questions and say, yeah, I think the user should be able to do that. Or no, it's OK that they can't do that. And by the end of that work week, we were ready to release except for one upstream bug in uh, one of our dependencies and then that got fixed within the next week and then in April of 2015 Mailman 3.0 this big rewrite was able to go out the door. So what are some lessons from that? One is sometimes it might look to the new outsider like there are no explicit priorities. Um, maybe it might look like there's no roadmap and if you see that it might be genuinely because there's an argument. There people have different opinions and there's a slow, quiet fight about it that you just haven't heard of yet. But sometimes it's because no one's gone to the trouble of bringing up the question and checking and making it explicit. And once it's explicit, then people can make better and more specific plans about what to do first, both developers who can decide what they want to work on and who depends on what, but also users who can figure out um, when they should expect new features. And this doesn't have to be something that you're invited to do or that you're a senior manager to do. I came in as an ordinary contributor and then just by asking these questions and taking on some of the work of scaffolding other people, uh, I was able to help expedite this release. First draft, the next lesson might be that first drafts that you can write are like springboards to help the rest of your team. I was not the person who finished those release notes, but I started them. And then someone who knew more could finish them off. I was not the person who made final user experience decisions about certain aspects of the front end, but I could say, yeah, I think you should try that way. And then my colleague could try something, iterate, and then see what made sense uh, and get some more user data. Those first drafts, just providing something so that people are starting by editing something that exists instead of trying to start from a blank page, it's a way that you can really supercharge the people that you're working with who have complementary skills. And I think the, the last lesson that I might mention about working on Mailman is you don't have to be a lead developer in order to pick up that marker, right, and help other people out by expediting a release in this way. And in fact, it can be better if you're not. In my opinion, uh, I think it can be really helpful if one of the leaders, one of the maintainers of a multi-maintainer open source project is not particularly enthusiastic about programming, or that's not their, their main or their sole enthusiasm. I, I can program. I do. I program in Python in particular. But programming is not the primary thing I feel enthusiastic about in group software projects. And so when it turned out that what Mailman needed was not in particular my programming talents, I didn't feel bad. I felt useful. And when I see a bug that needs fixing in a project that I'm helping, I don't particularly get tempted to go fix that bug, which would draw me away from the project management work. Instead, I delegate that and I think about how to prioritize it and who could do that work and what processes and relationships they need to support them. And I think that people who mostly want to write software can lose focus on the big picture of project success, which is why it's helpful to have people with complementary interests running a project together. Next I'll talk about a time when the way that a project got unstuck was partly through gathering funding. Uh, now the issue of 
paying for work in projects where previously all of the work had been volunteer is one that we've definitely been talking about for decades, really, in open source. And I actually would refer you to Benjamin Mako Hill's 2005 article, Problems and Strategies in Financing Voluntary Free Software Projects. And there's a link to that in the notes and outline uh, that you should have a link to, because I think it covers a lot of the, the gotchas and the things that can work. I also think that it's very interesting and important to talk about grants as a source of funding for open source work. And I have applied for them successfully and unsuccessfully myself. And I talk about that in a talk that I gave a 10 minute talk at Pi Ohio uh, in the middle of 2020. And the video and transcript and slides for that are all up. I've linked to that in the outline for this talk. And so I'm not going to go into much into how and why to apply for grants and how to structure that. But I do want to talk about another sort, and there's a number of other ways you can help people gather funding through initiatives like Tidelift, certain kinds of crowdfunding, and so on. But right now I want to talk about corporate funding. And in particular, we'll talk a little bit about GNU AutoConf and how funding helped turn that around. GNU AutoConf is a tool for producing configure scripts for building, installing, and packaging software on POSIX systems such as GNU Linux. It's a core component of the GNU build system, aka auto tools. And when a user installs a software package that's written in C on the command line by compiling it from source, and you've probably often seen the instruction to run dot slash configure, make, make install, um, that configure script at the start has to come from somewhere, and the developers of those packages often use autoconf to create them. It was founded in 1991. Releases came in a pretty, pretty steady clip up until the early 2010s. And then in uh, April of 2012, there was a release of autoconf 2.69. And volunteers kept working on it after that, but they just didn't have the spare time to test and cut a release from Trunk, from Gitmaster. So in January 2020, a guy named Keith Bostick sent a slightly plaintive email to the AutoConf mailing list saying, is there someone I can pay to make a release? Uh, and my friend Zach Weinberg saw that because he is an AutoConf contributor and also a contributor to a number of other GNU projects. And he sent me a note thinking that we could work together on this. So in February, we sent Keith an email and started talking about a first engagement. Uh, and we discussed maybe doing a discovery phase. In the world of consulting, you often see this, that instead of diving in with one big engagement to execute on a bunch of change, the very first engagement is much smaller and cheaper and shorter. And it's just, let's look and figure things out. Let's look at the situation, map out the problems, and list off some of the to-dos that are necessary in order to address those problems. So we did that. We got some money from Keith in March. And uh, by June, we had this giant to-do list shared, and we were able to identify the subset of that that we thought was necessary in order to get 2.70 out the door. Keith was willing to pay for part of that, um, but we needed more money, and so that's when Zach and I emailed some of our contacts in the larger world of people who we thought might be interested in supporting AutoConf because their organizations cared. In some cases, this was organizations where people with email addresses affiliated with that company had emailed the AutoConf mailing list at any point somewhat recently. But also we tried to think what organizations might care because we think they probably use this or they are probably one degree away from using this. And that's how we thought about talking to Bloomberg who ended up partially funding the project because they care about Python and CPython developers need to use AutoConf. We were also able to get some money from the Free Software Foundation which has a fund devoted to helping fund the GNU toolchain. So we were able to get that money in August of 2020 and then use it, mostly Zach used it, to review code, uplift patches, triage bugs, get things into one single source of truth, and uh, fix a bunch of regressions and make some betas, listen to reports, and eventually, as of December 2020, release AutoConf 2.70. Now, some lessons, including some gotchas here. Uh, what worked here partly is that there was someone who was already offering the money, but that might not be as rare as you might think. It's worth, if you're thinking about this, 
look for people in your worlds who may have already said, hey, could I pay for this? Uh, they might have said this in private conversation. They might have said it on the mailing lists or in issue trackers. And Benjamin Mako Hill in his article points out that the worry of paid labor displacing voluntary labor or otherwise being inappropriate uh, partially goes away under some circumstances. And one of them is if the thing being done is something that everyone already has consensus ought to be done, and it would benefit everyone, not just, let's say, one corporation or one particular group of users. And if it's something that needs doing, but that demonstrably the existing volunteer pool has not really been able to accomplish. Also look to see if you can work with existing credible contributors. Zach was not yet a maintainer and someone who could upload releases of autoconf when our engagement began. But over the course of that initial discovery engagement, he got that uh, privilege from the existing maintainers. He, and that was incredibly helpful, right? Working with someone where they were already known to have good judgment. Some gotchas though, this can be slow. And I, I mean, just the funding bit, right? Uh, that initial email with Keith was in January and then all these bits along the way, lots of back and forths. And then eventually December is when we got 2.70 out the door. Also, it was kind of slow just to, to get that. The big chunk of money came in August, right? So we had a lot of steps along the way. Also, watch out for fixed price engagements. Preparation, as Zach puts it, for the AutoConf 2.70 release took almost twice as long as anticipated. And Zach says, I made five beta releases between July and December and merged 157 patches, most of them bug fixes. And the reason, oh, this is me talking now, one big reason why that was necessary, regressions. Because AutoConf does not have continuous integration yet. We're working on that now as volunteers, but if you don't already have CI in place and you're trying to do this kind of release expediting, you're possibly going to find and have to fix a lot of regressions, which could be a time suck. So this is where you might want to think about the balance between a big appealing marquee initiative like expediting the release of a long delayed project that might balance against the desire to have incremental work that it gets paid for incrementally so that you don't end up in this kind of situation. I'm happy to talk about that more in the conversation afterwards. Finally, I wanna share a case study of a time when the thing that needed doing was really just nudging, prioritizing, and communicating. Uh, here I'll talk about PipEnv, which is a Python packaging and package management tool. It had had a pretty steady clip of releases uh, from generally mostly volunteers uh, going up until November 2018 when there was a release and then development continued but the maintainers didn't have time to make a release. And then in March 2020, this got to a point where someone suggested that a particular list of recommended tools remove PipEnv because it, may, it seemed to be stagnant. By this point, I had done a substantial amount of mostly paid work with the Python packaging tool Ecology, so I knew the right person to ping in IRC, and I said, hey, you saw this? Uh, he's one of the man maintainers of PipEnv, and he said, yeah, yeah, I've been, I even have time for my company right now to contribute back to open source, and I wanna use it on this project, but I just keep getting distracted and not working on the right thing. I said, well, what do you need? in order to make progress on getting the next PipEnv out the door. He said, honestly, I need someone to just nag me and come into chat and yell at me if I'm work not working on the right thing. I said, would you listen to that? He said, basically, yeah, at first I would fight and then I would say, yeah, yeah, you're right. And I would say, so I started doing that. I mean, he was very clear that that's basically what he needed. So over the next few months, between March and May, 2020, I spent maybe 15 hours as a volunteer basically coming into IRC several times a week and saying, hey, Dan, what you're working on? And uh, helping him. Maybe if he was like, oh, I feel so overwhelmed, I don't know where to start, I would pick a likely starting place. Or if he knew that he needed to send an email to the mailing list, but I uh, didn't feel good at writing those, I'd write a first draft and we'd share it in Etherpad so he could edit it and then send it. Uh, I communicated on his behalf just sort of as the Dan translator into some GitHub comments. And I helped him just by being a support person. And he ended up having to put out a couple of betas, things that took longer than he hoped. But over the course of those months, he did those beta releases. And then in May, 2020, 
the next release of Pipenv came out. And he has kept it up. The Pipenv maintainers have kept it up. June 2020, there was a release. And then in August, and then two in November. So some lessons from this. One is that you can actually do a lot with a little. 15 hours is not actually that much. I hope that that helps you think about what it might take, actually what a reasonably small commitment it might be to unlock a lot of value for, for all the users and, and developers who are involved with the tool. Also, I think the second lesson, and this is really interesting, if there's a trust relationship between you and the other people involved, you can actually be honest with each other about what's missing, what do you need? What would complement you? And then when people can honestly support and complement each other, that can be an amazing catalyst. Dan had the technical know-how and a lot of you know, the engineering judgment that he needed. What he needed was nudging, support, uh, and help with getting over the initial overwhelmption for certain kinds of tasks. The, we've all dealt with different stuckness types, I think, and I've illustrated a few of those here in these stories. Sometimes there's a release that needs expediting, something in more of a digital category. But you can also see sometimes social stuckness, right, where people, oh, like, we really need to deal with this one person, and, and that, that can be a social stuckness. There can be a different kind of digital stuckness, like the Wiscon kind, where it had to do with information, important resources being scattered in a lot of places and hard to navigate and use. There can also be financial stuckness uh, where it's necessary to uh, spend money on something and we just don't have it. Um, and legal as well, right? If uh, the thing blocking you from moving forward is, for instance, something involving uh, not having a trademark or not having an organizational home like a fiscal sponsor. So now uh, I'm going to talk about what some the sequence is, I think, that no matter which of these kinds of stuckness you're dealing with, I think that you probably have a somewhat similar sequence of what skills to, to build and employ so that you can build credibility and make change. And uh, after I talk about this, I'll be talking about why maintainers tend not to have these skills, as far as, I, uh, as we can tell in general, and how we can change that. But first, what skills would one need to deploy? And this is in um, the table of contents, really, of the forthcoming book that I'm writing on Getting Unstuck. Uh, there is a free sampler that is available right now that you can download from my website uh, once you subscribe to my extremely rare one to 10 times per year email list. Uh, but I'm also just gonna you know, share this basically orally now. Um, the sampler has three chapters that you can read that have more uh, go into more depth on individual particular skills in this sequence. Um, and then I'm working on the book proposal for the, the full book and aim to write a full draft in the next few months. But why do you have to do this? Why, why is there a sequence? Why can't you just, you know, pick and choose? Well, I think that when you imagine something that you care about, handing over the keys to somebody else, handing over the ability to make substantial change in any kind of the infrastructure that you care about, you gotta trust them, right? So in order to cause other people to think it is a reasonable idea to trust you, you have to pitch in and do some work on everybody else's terms for a while so people can tell that you are a reasonably reliable person with good judgment whose values are aligned with theirs. And as you go, at least early on, it can be really helpful if the main opinions that you have and that you uh, share when it comes to arguments really are just the ones that have to do with your core values on how people treat each other. And then on other engineering questions about architecture, code style, what platform to use, it can be really useful if you don't really have a, a dog in that fight. Your main opinion is, this is blocking us, so I would like to facilitate us getting this resolved and demonstrate that power for power's sake is, is not your goal. So now I'll share this uh, sort of skill sequence, and this is kind of everything in the kitchen sink, a bunch of tactics that you might want to use, but you do not have to memorize all this. You don't have to follow all of it to understand the rest of the talk. Like I said, this is in that table of contents for my forthcoming book. It goes in basically four sections, settling in, taking charge, making change, and then leaving, because <laughs> leaving should be an important part of the cycle. When you settle in, 
you do routine stuff that does not require that other people trust you or trust you much. This is stuff like submitting improvements to documentation, suggesting improvements to other people's code in the code review queue, so you're helping review pull requests and patches. You may ask for the triage permission, which has a lot fewer stakes associated with it than the commit bit often, so that you can help with bug triage. And you take inventory, you take a look, you, maybe you see if you can help with that turning over the cushions and opening up the drawers so you can consolidate things and put things in one place and see what you can do to map this project's position and velocity. Where is it? Where is it trying to go? How fast is it getting there? And what are its upstreams, downstreams, and competitors and things like that? Next, when I say taking charge, I mean start doing things that require trust, but that everyone else basically already agrees ought to happen. There's a general consensus that these are good things to do. These are things like noticing and dealing with people issues. These can be opportunities like growing, promising people, finding people who are contributors who ought to have more nurturing and maybe even promotion to maintainer. Um, and working with neuroatypical people who, because of lack of accommodation, have not been able to fully flower. Also, you could help deal with some people headaches, like maybe working with unskilled volunteers or even beginning to deal with the malicious and negligent people that unfortunately you might run into. You can help by noticing and managing rhythm mismatches in this stage as well. This would be cadence sheer in participation where some sets or individuals uh, of people are trying to move a lot faster, trying to change the rate of participation of the project compared to others. Some are moving a lot slower than others. If it makes sense, you could run meetings at this stage. If meetings are a thing that people kind of agree should happen, you can make them happen better and more effectively. And now is a stage when you can help listen to what other people want, set up structures for them to make roadmaps and to prioritize what needs to happen and you can be a release manager and make releases again more as a process manager and then there's the making change stage once you have earned more trust uh, rightfully one hopes in this project you can help build and modify infrastructure so that could be social infrastructure like communication processes codes of conduct internship programs like Google Summer of Code and Outreachy, synchronous events. Uh, there's a link in the outline to a guide that I wrote about how to use synchronous events well. You could add some product management and user experience processes to help with your software processes, like qualitative thinking, like uh, interviews, user interviews, watching people use stuff to see what the snags are, quantitative thinking, like A-B testing and heat maps. Again, this may seem like a lot. I'm not saying you must do all of these things as a good maintainer. I'm saying these are tools and tactics that you could use. Some digital change you could make, not so much to the project code base. I'm thinking more about architectural changes to the capacity of your team to do digital work. These are things like workflow improvements and unifying communication platforms. Financial infrastructure building, you know, maybe for the first time crowdfunding or applying for grants. Legal change in infrastructure, the, you know, getting a trademark, getting a fiscal sponsor. Passing the baton is the last step. Sustainability means being able to say no and to leave. So finding successors along the way and handing over is, I think, a fairly important part of this sequence. Ending is not a failure. It's a part of the cycle. In the last 10 minutes, I'll talk a little bit about why maintainers don't usually have these skills and some ways that we can start to change that. Think about the open source software maintainers you know and have worked with. Where did they come from? What were they up to? before they started maintaining projects, whether they founded those projects or joined them after founding. Think about it. Think about what some of their skills were and what some of the roles were that they had. Probably most of the people you're thinking of, you would agree they weren't managers before. They did not have roles where they learned and executed on skills of managing group projects, managing collaborations. There's always exceptions, for sure. And I definitely want to hear about it if I'm wrong. Please let me know uh, in Venulus later. But 
in my experience, maybe uh, some people, their parents, and so that has a lot of managerial experience associated with it. And some people have personal experience doing something like managing a theater troupe. But in general, when people start open source software projects, they don't have a bunch of experience in communicating with other people about priorities, making roadmaps for shared group projects, doing marketing, writing grant proposals, uh, diplomatically rejecting other people's proposals for group projects and, and so on. And then there's what we value and thus grow along the way. So when people come into open source as contributors, in general, at conferences like this one, there's absolutely going to be uh, a big chunk of people who say and mean and believe all open source contributions are valuable and all types are equally valuable. And the person who does marketing and the person who does design and the person who does project management and the person who does testing and the person who does project management or event planning or grant writing is just as valuable as the coder. But when you see how projects act, when you see when people say, oh, your GitHub is your portfolio, and what they mean is your commits, not your communication. When you see the kinds of problems that maintainers tend to see and the kinds of solutions that they tend to make, which are usually tooling and code and things like that, you see that in our industry as a whole, we generally don't actually act like uh, the skills of communication and project management and coordination are so valuable that people whose main skill is coding seek it out and seek it. You know what I really got to get better at is this. Um, and I'd like to change that. And we've seen some change in this. But uh, and I'd like to tell me if you think I'm wrong as well. But what we value and thus grow much more on the code side, much less on things like project management. And we don't really have enough tools and practices to grow and train these skills. There's no advent of code for maintainership. And there's very little in the way of resources for coming in and learning how to maintain a legacy project that already exists. Uh, and that's why I'm writing this book. So let's change that. So first I'll talk a little bit about some initiatives that already exist to help teach parts of these skills. And then uh, we'll do a little bit of wish list making. Cooper has a release management shadow program where people who are going to be release managers, the cycle before, they serve as apprentices who shadow the existing release managers. So that's a fantastic idea. And I encourage you to think about whether that's something that you can do in your own project. There's a Mozilla leadership curriculum so that people can learn skills for leadership in open culture and open source software projects more generally. Simply Secure is a nonprofit that teaches user experience related skills to open source software maintainers. And uh, they just did a gig with the Python Software Foundation where, among other things, they taught a basic user experience research and design class to maintainers of the Python packaging tools. There's Carl's book, of course, Carl Fogel's book, Producing Open Source Software, which is a fantastic book, basically the, you know, the best book on creating and running a new open source software project from scratch. And then there's my upcoming book, uh, which will be in some sense a sequel to that, right, about coming in and helping level up and maintain a legacy project. Those are some existing resources and, and initiatives that help people learn maintainer related skills. We can, in just our own personal lives, do things that are more like the, the Kubernetes release manager shadow program. The next time that you're communicating to someone in a way that you know you have to be a bit diplomatic about it, or the next time you're looking at a bunch of bugs and you're triaging them, or you're thinking about doing some research for what corporations or foundations might you be able to get some grant funding from, or any kind of maintainer task, see if there's somebody who could possibly shadow you. In the medical field, they have this idea of see one, do one, teach one, so that this apprentice watches you the first time, and then you watch them and give feedback the second time, and the third time they teach somebody else. But tools, tools can help. 
Absolutely. And tools and practices can help us as maintainers, and they can help us teach and shadow and be shadowed. I would really love for us as a group to think about ways that we could have improvements to the tools that we use for these purposes. And I've come up with a bunch of ideas, but I'll just concentrate on a few in the last few minutes of this talk. As a maintainer, think about how once you have a project really sweetly running, there's a bunch of stuff in the configuration of it. Let's say it's a GitHub project. You have labels and milestones, and there are templates for new issues and new pull requests. And maybe there's a particular set of privileges of who can do what, who has commit, who can triage. Wouldn't it be great to clone that so you start a new project with all of that infrastructure already set up? I don't think that's possible right now. I'll be really embarrassed if it turns out that it is, uh, but I'd love to be able to do that. And then when it comes to teaching, a lot of maintainership is communication. It's writing, you know, more markdown than, uh, you know, code that a computer is going to execute. It's uh, emails, it's documentation, it's issues and replies to issues and patches, it's grant proposals, it's talk proposals. It's, and those, re those replies, that is a place where a tremendous amount of labor, and especially emotional labor, right, diplomacy goes. I can make a saved reply, a saved response where I have a bit of boilerplate and then I can select it when I'm replying to an issue or a pull request. So I can maybe very diplomatically say, hey, uh, you need to fix that commit message. Or, you know, we could really do a lot more with that if we had funding and here's our current funding situation. I'd like to share those. I'd like to be able to say, hey, within my GitHub profile, here's my saved responses and, and they're shared so I can share with you the results of all this emotional labor. Similarly, I'd like to be able to ghost write a draft for somebody else. So, that, you know, here's the URL where I'm replying to this issue. Here is a chunk of text that already works in GitHub syntax with at mentions and hyperlinks to issues and stuff like that. And then you now have this draft that you can improve on and then post as yourself. Uh, so that I can help somebody out. Uh, this is something that people could do to distribute the load a little bit. These tools and practices, and I, I hope my upcoming book, I hope they can help us all learn from each other, learn the skills to help keep projects unstuck and to get them unstuck. Because it's not just lead developers and founders and the existing maintainers who can, you know, be Frodo and go on that journey. I truly believe that based on my own experience of, in most of these cases, making extremely few or no code commits to the projects that I was involved with in these, in these cases, I didn't have to be a lead developer. I didn't have to be the founder. A new person who already has open source software skills can come in and unlock tremendous potential for users and developers. I think basically anybody can be Frodo. And I'd like for us to work on this together over the course of, you know, uh, after my book comes out, I'd like for you to consider taking a look at it. And uh, I'd love for you to look at the sampler to see what I've already written and contact me with your ideas, experiences, thoughts, because I think that open source software projects getting stuck is not inevitable. I think it's avoidable. I think it's somewhat fixable. And I'd like for us all to learn more about how to do that together. Thank you very much. Wow. Wow. That was such a great talk. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's I had very so kind. many takeaways from that. I am definitely uh, yes. going to be looking uh, under the couch and opening all the drawers, though I think I got that round the wrong way. Which is ah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, some of those couches are fold out, right? So yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, um, we uh we have got like one, or we're going to be cheeky, maybe two minutes, uh, for some talks. Oh, oh, do we? Okay. I for thought, questions, uh, we didn't. Um, yeah, I can take a single question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, 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 the first question that we're going to throw to you is, can we pre-purchase your book? I wish. Um, so the, I have not yet chosen whether I will self-publish 
or whether I am going to end up going with a traditional publisher. I am writing a book proposal right now so that I can send it around to a few publishers and then help make that decision for myself. But I will be spreading the word once it is available for pre-order uh, or, or purchase. And if you want to know more about when it's going to come out, maybe get more excerpts as I write more, please subscribe to my extremely infrequent <laughs> mailing list on button down. There's a link to that on the, the book sampler offer page and you'll get one to 10 emails per year. Cool. Um, I think we've got time for just like maybe mm -hmm. a really short question. So, sure. Oh, and I should so say if any, if any of you are publishers or agents, feel free to talk to me about uh, it. Go <laughs> ahead. Sure. Unfortunately, I'm not going to take one of the ones from what I've been passed through the chat because they're not short questions. Okay. All right. Um, sure, sure. You mentioned time boxing and so did yes. Emoju in this morning's keynote. How important okay. do you find it is personally to develop that time boxing skill and how do you, how difficult is that? Um, I think that uh, depending on where you are in your life and what your individual schedule is, um, you know, different people might feel different ways about it. I am a reasonably busy person with a number of commitments. Just a few days ago, I was talking with someone who is interested in uh, joining new open source communities who seems to have many more hours available per day than I do just because different people's lives have different configurations. But I would say that if you consider yourself to be a, a somewhat busy person and you often have situations where you're like, ah, I don't feel like I have enough time, then yeah, I would say, uh, also, if you find that you have any perfectionist tendencies, it is extremely helpful to say, I am just going to spend n minutes on doing this. Um, and I think uh, talking with friends and uh, having people that you can bounce around ideas with is incredibly helpful here because that helps you get a very rough range of, is this a reasonable amount of time to spend on this? Um, instead of possibly spending way too little time and feeling like, well, I didn't get anywhere or ending up in a, in a big morass because your, your time box was way too huge. This is where having um, what uh, I believe educational psychologists call a community of practice is incredibly helpful. So people can talk with each other. And this is why in my book, I'm going to try very hard to suggest, for instance, when you do this, it should take, for instance, hours, not days or something like that. <laughs> uh. You are speaking directly to my heart with that. Awesome. Thank you so much again. Um, we do need to go.